Now on to our next session. Uh, our next speaker is architect Bjark Ingels, the founder and creative director of BIG, uh, Bjark Ingels Group. Bjark defines architecture as the art and science of making sure our cities and buildings fit with the way we want to live our lives. Uh, through careful analysis of various parameters from local culture and climate, ever-changing patterns of contemporary life to the ebbs and flows of the global economy, uh, Bjark believes in the idea of information driven design as the driving force for his design and creative process. Uh, Bjark, uh, great to have you with us today. Thanks so much for joining us at Wired Live. Over to you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so, um, so what I'd like to spend uh, the next 15 minutes or so um, talking about is, is something that has been sneaking up uh, on us uh, in our work over the last uh, uh, two decades. Um, you can say that we are architects and designers, um, or in Danish, form givers, uh, which means that we give form to the world around us at all scales from uh, uh, essentially product uh, to, uh, to, uh, to planet. Um, this is uh, our different work environments, or at least what they used to look like. Of course, like everybody else, uh, we've been working like this for the last nine months. Uh, and our um, uh, model shop was instantly turned into a, a sort of a makeshift medical equipment uh, 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 factory for the first uh, eight weeks of, uh, of, of the shutdown. Um, but apart from sort of uh, these kind of radical changes of uh, how, we, uh, how we work and uh, our work environment, um, it also gave, gave rise or accelerated another change that has been happening I would say beginning uh, 20 years ago uh, with our first project, which is the Copenhagen Harbor Bath. Uh, essentially the Copenhagen port had become so clean that we could extend the life of the city into the water around it. Uh, we've made another one in Aarhus uh, recently, but essentially uh, it became clear to us that an environmentally friendly city or port is not only good for the environment, it's also amazing for the lives of the people inhabiting it. Uh, and we've called this uh, hedonistic sustainability. The idea that sustainable buildings are not only good for the, for the environment, they're actually better for the lives of the people living in them. Uh, and, uh, and last year we, we opened our sort of last iteration of, of this idea. Uh, it's essentially the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. Um, it is so clean that there are no toxins coming out of the chimney. Uh, and because of that, we've been capable of turning its facade into a climbing wall. We've been able to turn its roof into an alpine park where you can hike. Uh, you can, uh, of course, uh, sort of scale the 100 meters of extreme danger by climbing the actual facade itself. Uh, or you can take the elevator up inside the, the belly of the beast and, uh, and reach the, the roof park where we planted uh, hundreds of trees. And um, so this kind of range of indigenous plants from Denmark, Denmark doesn't have any mountains, but if we, do, if we did, and, and now we do, they would, uh, they would actually look like this. Um, and it's actually um, an all year skiing uh, alpine ski slope. Um, so as a little demonstration, you can see, um, uh, you know, things, things normally have to go, uh, you know, hours by car to get to the to Sweden. Uh, now we can actually take the elevator up on the roof of our power plant. Um, and, and I think it becomes a beautiful testament to the sort of game changing power of, of form giving that children growing up in, uh, in Copenhagen now, including my, my two-year-old son, they won't know that there was a time when you couldn't, of course, ski on the roof of the power plant or, or climb its walls. For, for the, so for them, that's their new normal. That's where they start dreaming about crazy ideas for, for their future, which makes me really excited to see what kind of a future they're, they're gonna come up with. So um, taking this idea one step further, we've been uh, working over the last, uh, uh, years with uh, the Oakland A's, the baseball team, um, and 
and the idea is basically to um you know typically stadia are like these kind of lonely giants in a in a sea of parking and we thought it's called a ballpark why why don't we bring the park back in ballpark so it's going to be located on the waterfront of, of oakland so uh, we're considering the the ballpark the the central park of this new neighborhood we're wrapping the streets of the city around the the park um and because baseball is an asymmetric sport with an outfield we can actually dip down the perimeter so so instead of a castle it becomes this inviting valley that you can enter into and it means for the sort of 80 or 90 game days uh you actually have uh you know uh, uh, a ballpark with this kind of beautiful uh, perimeter uh, park on the roof, uh, you know, the concessions, the bars, the restaurants open out to the park. Um, and the, typically the worst streets, the, the worst, worst seats are the ones the first, furthest away from the game. But in this case, they become park seats. So you can imagine on a game day, uh, this park is, uh, is for the, for the fans, but the sort of 270 other days of the year, it's for the people uh, living in Oakland. So in that sense, it really means that the kind of often wasted resource that a stadium is suddenly really becomes an integral part of the public space uh, of the city of, uh, of Oakland. Um, and of course, from the, from the stadium, you have these kind of spectacular views over the, over the valley and, and out onto the, to the port. Um, the cranes, uh, are the sort of classic cranes left behind from the old terminal that m urban myth has it that they inspired George Lucas to come up with the all terrain and transport uh, uh, vehicles from uh, uh, Star Wars 2. And, and, and a sort of a last example of how this kind of progression in architecture is beginning to carve spaces or, or urban resources back and give it to the public. Uh, is a proposal we've been uh, developing with Toyota, trying to see what is going to be the impact on our cities once uh, cars become sentient, they become driverless, mobility becomes a service. Um, so looking at all the different sort of technologies that Toyota is currently uh, advancing and see how they might, might impact our cities. And it's not the first time Toyota has been changing their game. They started being a loom company and then in the 30s their ability to make large complex machines made them the heir apparent to take over car manufacturing uh, and eventually became the largest auto manufacturer in the world uh, did the first mass produced hybrid car and and are continuing to to sort of propel this sort of transformation forward with personal mobility and and these kind of uh, e pallets uh, driverless uh, vessels so we basically sat down and said, like, how can we take all the te technologies that are there and apply them to a city of 7,000 people working and living there, analyzing, saying every third road in this city is going to be uh, for uh, electric vehicles as a service and pedestrians, like a normal street almost. Every third street is going to be like a promenade for shared personal mobility and for programs like pop-up stores or food trucks. And finally, every third street is going to be a park only for pedestrians. And then we sort of imagine taking these three types of streets and weaving them together in two directions, creating this kind of woven fabric where every city block has direct access from uh, a vehicle, but also from the promenade and the park. There's always a, a little park in the middle and that can be scaled up or down to, to fit the community. So, um, so essentially, when you look at, at the street today, it's a bit of a mess because you have everything and essentially also nothing everywhere. So by splitting it up in these kind of three parts, we create one that is uh, all for electric vehicles uh, and pedestrians, one that is the promenade, uh, also for personal mobility, and, and finally the park. Um, and that, that essentially means that you can walk from anywhere to anywhere in this city moving only through a park or bicycling only along a promenade uh, or, or using a, a shared piece of driverless mobility. So um, all the roofs are photovoltaic, powering um, a fuel cell energy storage system. The, the, the buildings are relatively uh, low rise, so we maximize the use of cross-laminated timber. 
Um, and within it, Toyota and their collaborators are going to experiment with all kinds of cohabitation between different kinds of movement. There's a matter net that delivers goods straight to people's homes. There's the fuel cell technology uh, becoming the energy storage for the, uh, for the entire city. And, and inside the homes, um, we experiment with all kinds of assisted living for the aging demographic of, uh, of Japan and, of course, beautiful views of, uh, of Mount Fuji. So you can say, like, what, what is paradoxical and interesting in my mind is that, in this case, it's actually an automaker that is commissioning the entire woven city uh, that we are scheduled to break ground on in uh, the spring of 2021. Um, but it actually gives over two thirds of the right of way that is currently monopolized by cars and giving it over to other forms of life, including human life, uh, animal life and, and plant life. So, um, so of course, that's, that seems to be a sort of a, a, a sort of very fundamental uh, shift that is uh, occurring. Uh, and of course, it's a prototype, but the, the principles can be applied to uh, all kinds of cities, including New York, Barcelona, or, or Tokyo. Um, and this basically brings me to, um, to the sort of corona quarantine. Our offices in New York are located in Dumbo. So from our windows, we look out at the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and um, we started looking into the, the history of the Brooklyn Bridge. When, when it opened, 425,000 people were crossing every day. Uh, but then when they modernized it and took down the streetcars uh, and, and moved away some bicycle lanes um, and made it for all cars, it actually uh, reduced its capacity by uh, almost uh, threefold. So today we are essentially moving cars rather than people. The people part is getting incredibly congested. Uh, and suddenly because of the, the quarantine, we suddenly saw this kind of a available space, uh, you know, parking lots were turned over to outdoor uh, terraces for the restaurants and the Brooklyn Bridge was used for uh, uh, Black Lives Matters demonstrations. Um, and it gave us, uh, gave us like the idea to maybe reconsider uh, the future of, of Brooklyn Bridge and maybe bringing it back to where it, it came from. The Brooklyn Bridge, built in 1883, is one of the most memorable and iconic structures in New York City and in the world. At its inception, the bridge was a symbol for the powerful new energy of the American city, and an innovative transit artery carrying 425,000 passengers a day on its cable railway and streetcars, and by bike, foot, and carriage. Sadly, these collective transit facilities were demolished in the 1950s to make way for the automobile. And today, the bridge moves a little more than 100,000 people a day, less than a third of its original capacity, many stuck in traffic below or crammed together on the dangerous shared walkway above. The result is a bridge that has become better at moving cars than it is at moving people. The Brooklyn Bridge is wonderful. It's a good bridge to walk across. It's not a good bridge to ride a bicycle across. It's really hot and crowded. Um, and during these times of COVID, it would really help to have more distance between the people. Tons of cars is like right beside both of the sides. And it's like very kind of like the air is just kind of like a little bit more polluted. I've actually been taking up biking recently. I've loved it so far. It's uh, changed my perspective when it comes to traveling. With Back to the Future, we propose a radical but incremental rethinking of the Brooklyn Bridge that takes advantage of congestion pricing and other innovations that will reduce and redistribute car traffic around our urban core. Beginning with the introduction of safe, dedicated bike lanes, slowly transitioning to include dedicated public transit routes, expanded space for pedestrians, and finally, paving the way for an electric and autonomous future. Towards New York Harbor, the resulting plaza in the sky is proposed as a flexible space, accommodating new sweeping views, quiet spaces for reflection, and a diversity of activities for New Yorkers, changing with the seasons and evolving over time.
At the bridge anchorages, legacy car infrastructure has strangled the historic bridge walls, impeded access to the waterfront, and divided communities from one another for decades. As the bridge transitions away from vehicular use, these ramps can be removed and life brought back to the historic vaults and their surroundings. 32 acres of public realm, more than five times the area of the High Line, will be created, reconnecting neighborhoods and offering natural and recreational spaces for adjacent communities and a growing city. In Dumbo, legacy city properties can be rethought and create spaces that will welcome New Yorkers of all stripes. Meanwhile, New York has been quickly changing around us. COVID-19 has revealed a city in urgent need of more public realm as New Yorkers take back their streets for play and for commerce. And nationwide protests have shown us what streets focused on people rather than cars might actually look like. As our aging subway system strains to keep up with demands and we look for new and safe ways to commute in the coming years, the creation of safe, dedicated shaded corridors for biking and collective transit is the most high impact and low cost urban investment we can make towards our recovery. These corridors can be interwoven seamlessly with the existing network of vehicular streets, creating a binary city that makes room for both people and for logistical demands. As innovations at the Brooklyn Bridge and other bridges are piloted, this network of people streets can branch out to reach across the city, strategically linking to the neighborhoods that need them the most. And as the Brooklyn Bridge did one and a half centuries ago, bringing New York back to the forefront of urban innovation. So essentially you can say um, this, this kind of slow process of, of, of carving back the public realm and, and, and giving the streets back to the people rather than to the automobiles that have been dominating them over the last century.